Good morning. Welcome to Savani United Methodist Church. We are glad you are here. And welcome to those out in video land here. Uh, if you are so able, will you please stand and join with me in our opening hymn, number 333, I'm Gonna Sing, verses 1, 2, and 4. Set us aflame today with amazement and joy. Open our paths to new visions and guide our feet deeper into your wisdom. Give us faith to trust your presence through Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
reading from the scripture in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and um, these are the verses covering Pentecost. I will be reading from the Common English um, Version. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. They were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood. Before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God. And if we can all stand together and join in hymn number 420, breathe on me, breath of God. Pentecost, the third of our great Christian feast, 
and sadly often forgotten, but there is Christmas, there is Easter, and there is Pentecost, which we celebrate today. You know, uh, it's kind of nice that it comes after uh, Memorial Day, because I, I hope that all of you were able to take a, you know, take some time to honor our fallen warriors and, uh, you know, have a little time of rest and relaxation. I was appreciative as I finally got my uh, herb garden in, you know, because I figured it was about time. Some of you will get it later. All right. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Question. Are you relevant? Now, perhaps I'm preaching to the choir today, but our message still needs to be said. As some of you may or may not know, our denomination has been involved in a vital congregations initiative for well over a decade now. And sadly, we are showing negative results. And unfortunately, this initiative started as a reaction, inspired by an increasing decline in United Methodist membership within the United States that sadly, again, has only accelerated of recent. Some say that our leadership and that our denomination is just overreacting. It's just the culture. Every mainline denomination is in decline. It's the COVID. All of those things are true, and membership in every mainline denomination is on decline. However, Christianity in the United States is actually growing. So how do these numbers add up? I ask that you be in prayer both with me and for me today as we look at our message titled, Are You Relevant? And as always, do not blindly accept what I or anyone says about the scriptures or God, but with the mind of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate today, and seeking the very face of our Creator, examine the scriptures and determine for yourselves that what I say today is true. Shall we pray? Lord, today on this holy day of Pentecost, we thank you for your spirit, and we pray once again that your spirit will reveal Jesus unto us here amidst us, and that we will be obedient, and that your spirit will burn in our hearts and our will as we go through this day, this week, and even into eternity with you. Amen. Now, while there is a lot of good stuff in the Vital Congregations Initiative, one of the issues it fails to address is that of relevancy. According to Barnum Research, the Pew Foundation, and the study commissioned by the United Methodist Church for this Vital Congregation Initiative, the number one reason people give for stop going to, that they stop going to church is they don't see the point. There's nothing different, there's nothing new, it's just another club. In other words, it's not relevant to their lives. But are we not supposed to be different than the rest of the world? Are we not supposed to be the proverbial city on a hill, shining forth the light of Christ as a beacon of hope to a hurting and dying world, bringing a message of hope healing and eternal salvation, the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If we are truly transformed, and indeed the new creations that the scriptures tell us we are, how is it that the world looks at so many mainline denominations and goes, meh, just another club? According to sociologists Melinda Denton and Christian Smith, this attitude is generated because over the past several generations, mainline denominations overall have not been creating disciples of Jesus Christ, but have rather been preaching and teaching what John Wesley called, and they call, almost Christians. Although the results of their research is well over 300 pages long, they conclude that mainline denominations 
primarily in an effort to be appealing and welcoming to the world, have watered down the gospel of Jesus Christ to the point that they are no longer preaching Christianity. Rather, they profess what the researchers have coined moral therapeutic deism. And while we will not get into the nitty-gritty of this belief system, they boil it down, there's a wide disparity, but overall they boil it down to just four points. Number one, God created the heavens and the earth. Nice start. Number two, God wants us to be nice to others. Number three, God wants us to feel good about ourselves. Number four, if we're nice enough, we'll go to heaven. Now, not rebutting these by point by point, but my first observation is, where is Jesus Christ in all of this? The researchers surveyed over 30,000 members of mainline denominations, including the United Methodist Church, and overall they concluded that Jesus is not at the core of their theological belief system. No wonder the world finds us irrelevant. If this is all the church has to offer, Anyone can find the nice feel-good stuff in the uh, self-help section of the local store or just a few clicks away on the internet. If this is all the church has, the off has to offer, I'd stay home too. Why waste a perfectly good day to sleep in? People may wonder why I warn them at the beginning of each message to search the scriptures. And it is because of this. If people had been reading their Bibles, they would have quickly realized that they would be being fed slop, or at best, milk toast. Because our God is bigger, and we owe God more than simple lip service. For remember, we are evangelicals. We are evangelists. We are to be the ambassadors of good news, of healing, hope, and reconciliation to this world. And the good news of Jesus Christ is that he died for us while we were yet sinners, proving God's love for us, and then rose again on the third day so that we might be redeemed and united with our Creator, our Father, for all eternity. Our primary scripture today comes from John chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. And on this day of Pentecost, which is generally accepted as the birthday of the Christian church, we return to Jesus' final discourse as he instructs the disciples, later the apostles, the core of what he wants them to understand. If you are so able, I ask that you please stand and join with me in the reading of John chapter 14, verse 7 through 14. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus speaking. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, excuse me, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father is me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, 
I will do it. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. From the passage we just read, we once again see that the disciples do not understand. They once again demonstrate their remarkable density. And to repeat myself as I often do, we really can't blame them. Jesus is giving them a great deal to swallow and comprehend, and not yet possessing the Holy Spirit, much of what Jesus has to say is difficult to understand. Even so, Jesus here does get a little upset with Philip. You still do not know me? Jesus goes on to express that if you have seen Jesus, which the disciples had, then they have seen the Father, for Jesus and the Father are one. But here is where the text gets a little difficult, for many, including myself, have often misunderstood it. For Jesus says, then believe me because of the works themselves. Next line. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. What? And here is where the misunderstanding usually occurs, because if you are like me, you are thinking of works as miracles. How can this possibly be? How many of you have performed or even seen works greater than that which Jesus accomplished? Jesus, almost on a daily basis, made the lame to walk, caused the blind to see, exercised demons, raised the dead, and even raised himself from the dead. So how is it that Jesus can say, I will do greater works than he? I can't think of anything miraculous greater than what he performed. But here is where the larger context becomes so much more important. And this is the larger context. Our Father God, Jesus, His Son, and the Holy Spirit have done some amazing and wondrous deeds throughout human history. But do you know what God says is His crowning achievement? What is the greatest work that God considers He's ever accomplished? Redeeming humanity unto Himself. Bringing a message of reconciliation to the world. Although the final discourse covers a great breadth of issues, the overriding theme from beginning to end is a message of faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. For our God is love. And God considers the greatest work he has ever accomplished to be the love exhibited by Jesus Christ so that humanity might be redeemed unto their Creator. Jesus himself says as much towards the very beginning of his ministry in John chapter 5, verse 36, as, the, as his Jewish adversaries were questioning him. Jesus responds that while John, that is John the Baptist's testimony is true, his testimony is greater, and his testimony is a greater work that he is doing. Think about that for a moment. In the light of all that we know about Jesus, of all the miracles that he accomplished, Jesus considers his testimony his greatest work. And what is that testimony? It is long and it is wonderful, but can be summed up in Jesus' own words to Nicodemus. That God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. How am I supposed to top that, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, 
and filled with the power of the Spirit. You shall share Christ's testimony and the testimony of your own to as many people as you can. Jesus was the first evangelical, sharing the good news of God with humanity. And as we saw last week, it is our commission to share that message with as many as we possibly can. From the passage that was read earlier from Acts chapter 2, on this great day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured forth upon the apostles and the disciples. But notice, if you will, prior to the passage that was just read, how many people were gathered together in prayer, waiting for the Holy Spirit? In Acts chapter 1, verse 15, it says about 120. Jesus fed over 5,000 people, which is probably more than 10,000. More than 500 people had been witness to Jesus after his resurrection. Jesus had healed more than 120 people. Why is it only 120 people are still following him? But then on this great day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, as the disciples were gathered together in prayer as Jesus had commanded them, the Spirit of our living God descended upon them and filled them with power and understanding. Devout Jews and curious onlookers came to see what was the sound and what was the commotion. Now did Peter or the other disciples heal anybody? Did Peter or any of the other disciples raise the dead, exercise demons, part great bodies of water? No, they simply shared the testimony of Jesus Christ and their own testimony of their interactions with Christ. And if you were to continue reading, you'd see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that about 3,000 persons came to know the saving power of Jesus Christ that day. Jesus promised that they would do greater things had been fulfilled. Jesus was going to the Father so that the Spirit could reign on earth. Are you relevant? In 1787, our denomination's founder, John Wesley, said, quote, I am not afraid that the people called Methodist should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or in America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast to the doctrine, the spirit, and the discipline with which they first set out. Sadly, many today hold that Wesley's fear has come true. I say, let it not be this church. Let it Let it not be Sabina United Methodist Church. There is nothing more relevant to a broken, hurting, and dying world than the saving and redeeming power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We do not do what we do because we want to be nice. That is what the pagans do. We serve others because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We love others unconditionally because God has loved us. We have become new creations, and knowing that joy, we want to make others, well, let God make other new creations. And we are willing to sacrifice our very lives because that is what God has done for us. Yesterday, shortly before closing our annual conference, Bishop Palmer gave a presentation on anti-racism. Okay, you hear that from every street corner today. How are we as Christians different than the world? And fortunately, Bishop Palmer went there. 
He gave little instruction on anti-racism and rather turned to wholeness and fullness in Christ. As his primary example, he told a brief story of the Reverend James Lawson, a friend and colleague of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. After Reverend King was assassinated, our country was in turmoil. Some sadly lauded the, the, uh, the assassin, James Earl Ray, and most of the country hated him and wanted him dead. But the Reverend James Lawson, a United Methodist elder, was not a moral therapeutic deist. He was a man transformed by the power and the Spirit of God. And Reverend Lawson concluded that if Jesus had died for him, a wretched and miserable sinner, then Jesus died for James Earl Ray as well. And if the power of the Holy Spirit could make Reverend Lawson whole, then that same power could make James Earl Ray whole as well. Such that in this era, this black man, a colleague of Reverend King, mourning the murder of his very close and personal friend, went to visit Mr. Ray in prison, and did so routinely, even becoming his friend. According to Don Price, a fellow prisoner who witnessed to Mr. Ray, James Earl Ray came to know the saving power of Jesus Christ, and both Mr. Price and Reverend Lawson were by his side when he died. That is relevancy. That is the power and the Spirit of God. As God has transformed you, so your witness and your testimony can bring the Spirit of God transformation to another human being. Going back to Bishop Palmer's presentation, Politicians, pundits, celebrities, social media figures, they all preach anti-racism. You hear it all over the place, and you will continue to hear it until Christ returns. It won't do a hill of beans. Only when people are made whole by the power of God will this nation, and indeed this world, truly be healed. And behold, are you relevant? Are you sharing the love of God, the redemption of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit with others? Or are you preaching the same message that the world is preaching? Just be nice. I shared last week, and I share again. According to the United Methodist Research and to this initiative, the average United Methodist members shares the good news of Jesus Christ with someone once every eight years. Last week I told you to wait for the Spirit, but to hurry in your delivery. Well, the Spirit is here, and eight years is far too long. Are you relevant? Because the good news of Jesus Christ it's just far too wonderful not to share. However the speed of spirit is leading you to respond today, listen and heed. And God's word always demands a response.
knowing it will bring about the best for all that are involved. We lift up first our shut-ins. Margaret, Evelyn, McGrace, Joyce, Marjorie, and Chuck. And pray that they will know your presence and your peace. And that we also will make our presence known to them. Reminding them that they are still valued members of this community and that they have been empowered by you to serve you up until the very end. We lift up the praise of Miss Connie, joined in wedded matrimony, holy bliss, and pray that as they celebrate this union, that they will grow in love with each other and grow in love with you. We lift up those who are suffering from illness and injury, Again, we pray your will, but we would like to see healing. And we would like to see these individuals return to normal productivity. In all these cases, though, may we reach out with whatever resources we have to help them, assist them, to comfort them, and just to let them know that we care. We lift up Dave, Melissa, Barb, the Sittler family, Deborah, Bart, Albert, Janice, Cynthia, Daniel, Sandy, Connie's sister-in-law, Kimberly and her family, Faye Gilmore, and Miss Linda's brother's David. We especially on, on this great and holy day lift up our graduates. Pentecost was a day of new beginnings, the celebration of the birth of the, your holy church here on earth. Graduation is a celebration of new beginnings for these individuals. Some are going to just another grade level, others are going out into this great wild and broken, hurting, dying world. We pray that our instructions to these individuals regarding you and your scriptures, that they retain, that as they go forth, they will seek your guidance in all that they do, and that they will grow in their love and their discipleship of you. We ask your protection from the dangers this world has to offer. And we ask that they realize that the greatest success that they can experience is fullness in you. We lift up our community, our nations, and our world's leaders. We again pray that they would only hear and receive wise and godly counsel that you would soften their hearts so that they would be willing to accept that counsel and act accordingly. We pray for the mayor of Sabina, Governor DeWine, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Vice President Harris, President Biden, President Zelensky, President Putin. We ask your blessing upon them and all the other world leaders, that they would serve you and you alone. We pray for those who the world tells us are our enemies, and pray that our hearts are like your hearts, that we hold no animosity towards anyone, but that in the face of aggression, we extend branches of healing and hope and friendship and love. Soften our adversaries' hearts so that they can see our endeavors, that friendship and kinship might be formed, and we might share your good news of salvation with them. We pray for your church, the outposts of your kingdom here on earth, 
we remind ourselves that you, Jesus Christ, are our head, and it is your instructions that we should be listening to and being obedient to. And in being this great and holy Pentecost day, we pray your spirit pour forth out here on Sabina United Methodist Church, that we will seek you with all our hearts, all our strength, all our understanding, and that your spirit will burn in our wills and our hearts and every ounce of our being that we don't fully understand. And that we will be a powerful force for your kingdom here in this community and beyond. As we go forth in this day and this week and beyond, May we turn to you first and foremost in all our endeavors, seeking your will and guidance. May we do all that we do for your glory and your honor, and not for the praise of men. Thank you for hearing our signs and sighs and groans, and translating them into what you understand. And when we come across those situations which we don't know which way to turn and do not know how to pray, thank you for teaching us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now at this time, if you are so able, I ask that you please rise and join in our closing hymn. What is normally and traditionally a Christmas song here on this great Pentecost day, uh, number 251. If there's anything I want you to take from this song, it is go tell it. It does not need to be on a mountain, just be going and telling it, the witness and testimony of Jesus Christ. And I would like to change, uh, if I had more time, I would have changed all the lyrics, but I'm not that poetically inclined. But uh, the chorus, if you would change it to from Jesus Christ is born to Jesus Christ is here, for he is here in our presence right now.
Young lad, would you get the lights for me, please? Yeah, you. And now for our benediction. And now may our advocate, the Holy Spirit, guide you in the ways of God and fill you with the peace that only Christ can give.